We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, let's uninstall Grub. How many people here know what Grub is? I would be disappointed if there were a lot of hands not raised. <laughs> uh, Grub is one of the pieces of software that basically everybody interacts with. Um, it's also one of the pieces that duplicates the most functionality, which is why we're going to look at getting rid of it here. Uh, I'm Ian. Uh, we'll have a quick little about me here. Feel free to snap photos or whatever about the, the information there. So we'll do a little quick little about me here. I'm a desktop software developer at System76. Uh, I mostly work with uh, Python, um, SCUS, uh, or uh, CSS, um, and then OS infrastructure and designing the way the, the OS works and stuff like that, which is where I got involved with the boot process. Uh, one of the things I'm really passionate about is boot times. And I know that's kind of a weird thing to get really obsessive about, but uh, I, I tend to suspend my laptop because uh, as a System76 user, I don't always get the best battery life, so it <laughs> uh, helps a little bit to, uh, to extend that a bit. Um, I really hate about me sections, so we're going to skip this part. Uh, quick disclaimer, um, this isn't an ad for System76. I am very sorry if that's what you were expecting here. Um, however, I would be happy to answer any questions about our company, our products, um, anything like that. Uh, after the presentation and uh, and everything's over, just want to keep it a little non-commercial. This is more about general stuff rather than stuff that's specific to System76. So why should we uninstall Grub anyway? Um, as I said, it's something that that everybody interacts with, and it's it's generally does its job. Uh, what did poor Grub ever do? Right? There's not any real reason to get rid of it, right? Well, there's a couple reasons. Um, the first off, it's a bit slow. Um, we'll get into this a little bit later, but boot times do suffer. It's very old. Uh, it hasn't really been rewritten. It was rewritten once, uh, a little, quite a, quite a long time ago. Um, it's fairly complicated. Uh, if you've looked at the Grub2 configuration for adding like custom entries, it's difficult to say the least. It's best just to stick with the automated stuff and hope it works. <coughs> And then it's also a little bit ugly. Um, I know this is a bit subjective, and there's not a lot of stuff that works better, but Grub makes it really easy to see itself very, very often, um, especially if you do any kind of uh, dual boot, or if you at one time had something that looked like another operating system on your machine. Grub tends to, to turn itself on and doesn't like to turn itself off. Um, so let's start off with uh, performance. Uh, performance is one of the biggest reasons, in my opinion. Um, so both of these are from the same system. Uh, one of them is booting with Grub, using Grub to start the OS. The other one is using our new pop <coughs> infrastructure, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit. It's actually this specific computer here that I'm running the presentation on. Uh, so using Grub, we can do see here using system to analyze uh, firmware, little long. Uh, the loader, that's the part that we're interested in. That's the, the actual bootloader, which, which goes from the firmware booting to starting the kernel up and getting the kernel going. And you can see there with Grub, it's about 4.48 seconds. So about five seconds for Grub to get loaded off the drive, start running, uh, load the init RAM FS, load the kernel, and then get transferred all over into that. Using not Grub, uh, we can see uh, that the loader's been cut down dramatically. It's down to 132 milliseconds, so, so a tiny fraction of what was going on before. The kernel takes a little bit longer. The uh, user space and the firmware are both almost exactly the same, which makes sense because we're loading the same user space on the same firmware. Um, but overall, we can see that we've saved uh, quite a few seconds overall. Uh, here we kind of highlight the difference in the loader, which is where a lot of we're saving a lot of that time. Uh, we can see overall it's it's a three, a little over three seconds, a little over 12% faster boot. Um, not that people spend a lot of time booting their computers, but if you do, this is a this is a big difference. And even if it's not, having a fast, snappy boot environment makes uh, makes the OS feel a lot more modern, a lot easier to use, <coughs> and uh, really goes a long way to to increasing your productivity. If you do have to reboot, you don't want to spend a lot of time waiting for it to reboot. So the other thing, Grub is kind of old. Um, does anybody here know how old Grub is? At the top of their head. Twelve years. Uh, it will get older than that. Grub was initially developed in 1995 as part of booting the GNU slash herd uh, operating system developed by our fine FSF. Uh, now it's widely replaced by Grub version 2, which was in development since 2002. 
Um, I was 10 in 2002, and now I'm here as an adult who can drink and drive a car and uh, sometimes fly airplanes and give talks at, at conferences, so that's a long time. Uh, just to uh, kind of highlight that a little bit, that's, that's kind, of, kind of an insane amount of time to be sticking with a particular piece of software, um, especially with basically no big revisions. It's been basically the same since 2002. It hasn't really changed at all. Um, old doesn't necessarily mean bad, but there's a lot of newer stuff available that takes advantage of some of these modern technologies like UEFI, GPT. You can do all that kind of stuff with Grub, but you're duplicating a lot of functionality. UEFI has all of the functionality of Grub already built into it, with the exception of actually loading the OS, which a lot of modern OSs do anyway. And, and just in case you miss, like, your OS can boot itself. Right? Like the Linux kernel actually has an EFI program built into it that loads itself into memory uh, and transfers execution to itself so that you can actually load the kernel directly from like an EFI shell and boot the computer up without using any bootloader whatsoever. It's actually kind of awesome. Okay. I'm going to take a deep breath. There's a lot of talking, a lot of text. Uh, a little bit less text from here on. I'll try to try to focus on explaining rather than necessarily just reading my reading my slides. Uh, and a little bit of humor. You're not free to move about the root partition. So next part, it's it's kind of complicated. Here's a list of things, non-exhaustive list of things that Grub supports. It supports a ton of CPU architectures, uh, including stuff that's mostly not not really used anymore. Spark, unfortunately, uh, Sun is, is, is not really with us very much anymore. I know that there's still some, some, some Spark stuff, but uh, for your general PC, you're not going to find a Spark CPU in there. Um, supports a bunch of operating systems, uh, including things like DOS. You can boot DOS using Grub. And uh, that's, that's some pretty serious hardcore uh, legacy support there. Uh, a whole bunch of file systems. We have a couple different types of extended file systems, vtreefs, uh, hfs plus, uh, some Windows file systems. Got a few more file systems, uh, FAT32, Riser, CPIO, both little and big Indian. Tons and tons and tons of different OSs. Uh, just a few more file systems in there for good measure, because we never know what kind of drive we're going to come across. Um, a couple more things that Grub supports, uh, automatic RAM, de RAM detection, which Linux already does. It will look at how much RAM you have, it'll try to find all of the bad RAM that you have and work its way around that so that if you do have a couple of uh, bad RAM chips on your, uh, on your, on your system, it'll, it'll work around those and, and prevent those from causing errors. Um, it supports decompressing compressed files uh, for booting your operating system, so if you have your kernel and your init RAMFS Packaged into like a uh, uh, usually they're, they're in a gzip or a, a, a seven or a, a, sorry, a xzip xz format um, can decompress those. It can it supports not decompressing the compressed files because sometimes you want to let the kernel do that. Um, network booting, which your firmware already does, uh, as a computer harder uh, as an employee of a computer manufacturer, I can guarantee you every single computer in this room supports network booting at the firmware level, so it's not something we need in the in the bootloader. And for good measure, a few more file systems. <laughs> um, so functionality is a good thing to have. Uh, you certainly need a little bit of functionality, right? Like, it has to be able to boot an operating system. Um, and, and usually having a good amount of, of functionality is, is a feature, but you want to balance that with the requirements for loading that functionality. Um, having functionality in something requires loading it into RAM and storing it on the drive. And the more functionality you have, the more stuff you have to take off of the disk and put into RAM. And, and that's one more thing that you have to put in, you know, spend time doing before you can start putting your actual operating system into RAM. And uh, you want to be available so that it's easy to get into the, the, the bootloader. One really important feature that, that Grub has is it allows you to modify the parameters that you're booting the, the operating system with. So let's say, for example, you're tweaking with some stuff and kind of kind of try to optimize your, or your OS a little bit. Maybe you, you uh, play around with uh, your init RAM FS and start removing stuff. 
all of a sudden uh, your system doesn't boot anymore and you want to be able to go in and configure the options to make sure it does. A really famous example of this, if you're running ex especially new uh, NVIDIA hardware, a lot of times you need to boot with the no mode set kernel parameter, which not every OS provides by default. And in order to get the OS booted so you can add that to the permanent configuration, you need to temporarily add it to uh, what you're booting up. So it's important to be able to, to do that kind of stuff. Um, you want to trim back what's available by default. and uh, because really, if you're booting an operating system, and you're, you're booting an operating system, right? Like, let's say, let's say you're making a, a custom OS, you're in control of the boot process from start to finish, and you can define what sort of hardware you're gonna support. And while it's a good <coughs> goal to try and support everything, sometimes that's not always necessary. Um, one of the things we looked at with Pop! OS is, you know, what kind of computers do we wanna support? And we said, generally, we wanna kind of trim it to, to, to PCs. And uh, PCs are pretty widely available, obviously. They have pretty good support. Um, x86 is a, uh, it's been around for a little while. There's a lot of software written for it. And uh, we want to make sure that stuff runs on it, but, but we want to also you know, be mindful of the fact that we don't want to provide software that, that doesn't need to be there. We want to we wanna make it as trim as possible so that people can add the stuff they need. Um, and you want to be fast. Being fast kind of comes as a, as a side effect of doing all of these things. It just kind of happens to be faster because there's less stuff that you have to do before you, uh, before you get going. And the most important thing, in my opinion, that a bootloader can do is, you know, start up quickly, get, get, all, in, all, get all set up and, and load it off the drive, and then put the kernel in the RAM so that the kernel can start doing its thing. Um, ultimately, I'm using my computer because I want to use my computer. I don't want to wait for it to boot. And the, the, the prime directive there for a bootloader is to get the OS loaded so that the OS can start running and you can start using it. And, and that's the most important thing, so we want to we wanna optimize for that. Uh, this one's a bit subjective. Some people have no problem with Grub. I'm, I'm pretty aesthetically minded. Uh, I think I think aesthetics are something that are often ignored in open source software, and and often to a detriment. Computer or uh, software that looks really good is something that people want to use. Um, you know, you shouldn't ever optimize for aesthetics over the function. But if you can make it look better while also making it work better, I think that's uh, that's going to be better than something that's that's a little bit uglier. Um, most great bootloaders have. Ugly UIs, the idea here is you don't need a big fancy GUI to load the, uh, the OS because typically it's not something the user interacts with all that often. Um, and big fancy GUIs are big. They take a lot of space and disk, they take a lot of space and RAM, and they slow down the, the boot. Um, and, and if they have an ugly UI, that's okay if they don't show up very often. Um, but like I said, Grub likes to turn itself on in a lot of cases, and, and it's difficult to make it stop showing. So uh, as an example, I, uh, I once had uh, a machine that had, I think it was Ubuntu, and we were still working on Pop! OS. So I installed Pop! OS, and uh, I had a grub menu because there were two operating systems to pick from. And I'd been working on this, uh, this boot stuff for a little bit longer than that, so I started using uh, uh, my special boot stuff here, special secret boot sauce. And uh, uh, every time, Ubuntu would start up, it shows me a choice between the two operating systems, even though I was picking which operating system I wanted to use at the firmware boot menu. You know, you hold F7, lets you pick different boot devices. UEFI also lets you just pick operating systems because it can just load the stuff. And I would have to pick Ubuntu, and then I have to pick Ubuntu again. And, and so it's duplicating a lot of that. Um, and uh, Grub's hidden mode, it has, a, it has a hidden mode where it doesn't show, but it also shows up sometimes in that kind of situation. It's like it doesn't, it's not doing what I'm actually telling it to do. Um, and if you do a boot, you're going to see a menu every single time you boot your system, even if you, you use that firmware menu. So like, let's say you're running Windows on a modern computer and you, you decide to do a boot with Linux. Um, you can pick Windows from the boot menu uh, on, your, on your hardware, and you can pick Linux from the boot menu on your hardware. But then Linux will load another menu and let you pick either Windows or Linux again. Um, and it's fine if it's the only one you're doing, but the boot, uh, boot manager in your, in your firmware is a lot faster. It's built in, it doesn't have to load as much stuff. 
and uh, usually it's a little easier to control it that way. Um, you can control it from within Windows, for example. You can't control Grub from within Windows. So, so we still need to boot the system, and getting rid of Grub means we can't boot it unless we find some sort of replacement. So we have a couple of requirements that we, we need to fulfill in order to do that. First of all, we need to have UEFI firmware. Um, UEFI has a lot of really good stuff, and I've talked before at a couple other conferences about why it's not evil. A lot of people in the Linux world tend to associate UEFI with negative things. Um, but really, a lot of the time, they're, they're actually talking about secure boot, which is a feature of UEFI, but not a requirement of UEFI. You, uh, secure boot can prevent you from loading your own operating system if it can't be disabled, but if you, dis if you can disable it, you can just turn it off and load whatever you want. Um, UEFI has the ability to, like I said, load an operating system automatically. Most OSs come with EFI programs to do this. Um, it's a lot more extensible. You have network connectivity. Um, firmware updates can be, can be done directly through UEFI. You don't have to go into an operating system. Um, all that kind of good stuff. We need to have a Linux kernel. Um, if you're trying to boot Linux without a Linux kernel, you're going to run into other problems. So that's, that's definitely a requirement. And it does need to have the EFI stub feature compiled in. Uh, I don't know of any distribution that's put out a release within the last about five years that doesn't have support for this compiled in. But it is something to note. If you're building your own, you want to make sure that that feature flag is turned on. Uh, the OS has to be installed in UEFI mode so that you're actually using the UEFI toolchain to boot the computer up. Um, it's also very important because uh, if you're not using UEFI, uh, there's a good chance your computer may not actually support it, and getting rid of Grub is going to be a fast way to have an unbootable system. Um, you need to have bootloaders for... Uh, sure, what's up? Um, just to understand the third point, you mean I have to somehow activate a mode in the BIOS, in the UFI if you're, and then install the operating system? If your computer supports UEFI by default, you shouldn't have to modify anything in the BIOS. If you previously disabled it, you'll want to turn it back on. The other thing to make sure of, uh, a lot of BIOSes come with, uh, uh, it's called a compatibility support module, yeah. which allows you to load uh, non-UEFI code in a UEFI environment. Um, that's used for booting legacy environments like DOS or older OSs that don't support that. Um, if, if you boot Linux in that mode, it won't be running in a UEFI compatible state and you won't be able to install, uh, you won't be able to modify anything that needs UEFI. Yeah, ju just for clarification, the most modern systems these days have UEFI and you basically can't actually turn that off. What you can turn off is the legacy compatibility. So you turn that off, it won't boot off an MVR system, it has to be GPT with UEFI. Right, right. Um, and and if, if your system does support UEFI, <coughs> usually in the boot menu they say like UEFI colon and then they'll have the name of whatever you're booting. And if it's non-UEFI, it'll say legacy or something other than that uh, before, it, before it. But if you boot the one that says UEFI and then the name, you should be good. Um, and there's ways to check from within the operating system. Uh, you look at uh, uh, slash sys. Uh, firmware, and then there's an EFI folder if you're running in EFI mode. Uh, we need Python 3, mostly because the little program that I uh, wrote to, to handle a lot of this stuff is written in Python, and if you don't have Python, you're going to have a hard time running Python. You'll probably need System D. Uh, I know that System D can be, it stirs up some hot tempers too. Uh, most people are a little more okay with System D than they are with Secure Boot, so we're probably all right here. Um, regardless, you don't technically need systemd to boot a system in UEFI. Uh, Ubuntu has been UEFI booting on Upstart for a long time. You can boot Debian, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's not a hard requirement. But systemd has some tools that make it really easy to, to manage this in a way that's also highly recoverable. Uh, and then you also need kernel stub, which is the Python utility that I mentioned. And a teeny tiny bit of time. It's actually not very long at all. So just to be clear, these are requirements for your replacement Correct. Boot booter. So this is, in you, your replacement booter only works in UEFI. It only works for Linux. And in order to configure it, you need Python 3. And in order to boot, you need systemd for your thing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Correct. Okay. okay. Correct. You only need Python at the time you write this. The configure. Disk. You don't uh, need it for every boot. You don't need it. You don't need it. It doesn't run at boot. 
It runs when you have a kernel update because it needs to keep things up to date. Um, and the specific process we'll talk about in, in a minute here. So if you're dual booting, then you can't use your boot firmware or your bootloader anymore. You can. Okay. Sorry. So we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. From the firmware. So there's a couple options for actually going about the replacement of Grub, and some of these may or may not require uh, some of the requirements I, met, I talked about. Um, you can remove Grub completely and use uh, System D boot instead. System D boot is, is a very minimal bootloader that provides the functionality you need to boot the system uh, without a lot of the excess stuff. It's, it's uh, basically an EFI chain loader that's got a couple of Linux specific features built in. Uh, you can keep Grub as a backup and use the uh, kernel's EFI subloader by default. Um, this is the method that I was using for a long time before Pop! OS came along uh, because it lets you take advantage of all of those EFI features, but you still have Grub installed for anything that requires it, for like modifying boot parameters or booting a, an OS that doesn't have support for this kind of stuff. Um, or you can just use the subloader itself and just wipe out everything else. Uh, it's a totally viable option, but if you need to modify kernel parameters or, or if something happens to your NVRAM, you have to use an EFI shell to recover. And if you're not familiar with the EFI shell, it's a little bit obtuse. It's basically like an extension of uh, the DOS shell. And uh, you can do it, but if you, if you want to run the, the kernel manually with an EFI shell, you have to probably know your uh, UUID for your root partition offhand, and that's not something a lot of people have memorized. Um, if you can memorize a UUID, uh, I owe you a beer. Because <laughs> that's impressive. Um, we're going to go with the remove grub completely and use system deboot instead. Because it's uh, the fastest total option and, and requires the least, uh, least amount of tinkering. So how do we do this thing? First of all, we have to install our dependencies. Um, if you're on a Debian installation, uh, kernel sub has some packages available uh, in a PPA uh, hosted on Launchpad. That will install all the uh, dependencies that you need to do this exact process here. Um, it's not terribly difficult. Kernel stub is really tiny. It's about 600 lines of Python. Um, and it, like I said earlier, it only runs when the kernel updates. It doesn't run on boot. Um, <coughs> We need to run kernel stub, and I have a little option here. It might be hard to see because the contrast is kind of low, but you basically just run kernel stub uh, as sudo. If you want options, there's a flag to add options. It spits out a bunch of terminal text, and then, and then you're all set, ready to go. Everything's been, been copied to the right place, and then we need to install system dboot, which is actually the bootloader that'll be running the, running the system. And uh, we do that with the bootctl command. It comes built into systemd. So if you're running a recent Ubuntu installation, you already have this. It's just not using it. Uh, you run it with an install command. If you have your ESP in a weird place, you have to add a little flag to tell it where it's at. But then we can see it uh, created a, an EFI boot entry for Linux boot manager, which is exactly what we need. Um, you reboot now to make sure that stuff actually boots, because if you reboot and it doesn't work, uh, you still have Grub as a fallback, so you can get back in and, and fix it. Then you can use your package manager and get rid of Grub. Or wait, it's not actually gone yet. So we have here, I've taken a look at, uh, at uh, my ESP. We're specifically looking at the uh, Ubuntu folder inside of the ESP, uh, which is still there, and it still has a copy of Grub. It's hard to make out because the text is a little bit blurry, but the, the name of that file right there is grubx64.efi. That is actually the EFI binary that is Grub, and it still lives on the ESP even if you've removed it using the package manager. We have to get really, really crazy if we want to, uh, to, to get rid of it. You have to go into the ESP, you have to remove the boot folder, because that has, also has a copy of Grub for uh, backup purposes. Um, that has to do with the EFI uh, boot specification, which I can talk about at length too. Uh, then you remove the Ubuntu folder, which has that copy of Grub, it has a copy of the Grub configuration in it, all that kind of stuff. Then you have to reinstall systemd boot, because that'll put systemd boot as ESP slash boot, which is the fallback, so it'll fall back on your, uh, your uh, systemd boot uh, item there. And then you can go into the uh, NVRAM, which is what stores those temporary EFI boot entries, and uh, remove the Grub option from the configuration there. Um, you don't have to add anything for system dboot. It takes care of that for you. So now we finally have a fresh grub-free system, and we can take advantage of uh, all of the stuff that that provides. 
Using System Deboot is pretty basic. Uh, there's not a whole lot that you have to worry about. Normally, it just boots silently, and you don't have to worry about uh, you know, going in and, and doing anything on each boot. Um, just run it. You can hold, uh, that should say space. I forgot to change that. Hold space for the menu. Um, and the menu will, uh, will show up, and you can pick an operating system to choose. Um, kernel sub automatically sets up your system D configuration, so you don't have to worry about configuring that. It also uh, keeps an old kernel and a recovery mode option listed in there, so if you do a kernel update and the new kernel doesn't work, you can still boot to the old one. Not a terribly common thing anymore. The Linux kernel is remarkably stable, but sometimes it does happen. Um, it runs automatically when the kernel updates, so it keeps all of the files on the ESP up to date and uh, takes care of everything that, that you need to worry about. Um, <coughs> if you need to change boot parameters so that every time you boot, you boot with a new thing, like let's say you get a fancy video card and you need no MOSET, uh, you just set, you use kernel sub dash O and then your option list to, to set the new boot options and those get stored in the, uh, in the configuration. Um, System Deboot itself does have some dual boot options. It runs any other Linux just fine. Um, it can detect Linux kernels that are prepared in a fairly specific way automatically, or you can add entries using a pretty flat file system uh, file that's just a basic text file. It's very similar to the old Grub1 style boot entry files. So those are pretty easy to use, and, and uh, you can look at the one that Kernel Stub creates as a, as a good sample. Um, here's a look at the menu. Uh, we can see that it's uh, showing me stuff for Pop OS. It has uh, the current version, cur current kernel version. We have the old kernel underneath that, um, the recovery mode, and uh, it also has an option to go into your EFI configuration, which is something that a lot of EFI bootloaders can do because EFI is just a basically a mini little operating system that runs underneath it. And here I've also pulled up the uh, uh, command line options editing thing here. We can see it adds some options to the beginning for the initrd, uh, which is required if you if you don't have like file system support in your kernel, which a lot of them don't. Uh, we have a root partition option, and then somewhere over here, because it has a UUID, it would uh, list the uh, kernel boot parameters. So you can edit those, just go to the end. This do normally doesn't even show. You don't need to, to do a whole lot with it. Say, so why is that prettier than grub? I don't see it, sorry. Because you normally don't, don't even run it. You normally don't even see it. And if you have a dual boot setup, it, it picks the default one and, and just goes with it. Um, you, can, you can hold shift to get to the menu. Um, additionally, this picture doesn't really do it justice. It, it's a little bit smaller. It runs at native resolution. Grub has a hard time with that sometimes. And it runs centered in the screen, which is a little visual, more visually pleasing. Um, it's a little bit subjective, obviously. You know, some people like different things, but um, like I said, it, a lot of bootloaders have ugly UIs because if you have a nice, pretty graphical UI, you have to load all that, and uh, that slows down the boot, which is not one of our goals that we want. We don't want to sacrifice functionality for the form of it, but uh, it does it does offer a little more extra um, for specifically booting Linux environments and stuff like that. How well does this interface work on high DPI displays? It works beautifully. It's not um, super small. Impossible it's reading. not. It's not super small. It does depend a little bit on your firmware. Okay. The firmware should support uh, high DPI fairly well, um, but the text it uses is fairly large by okay. default. It's a bit too big on a on a on a standard DPI display. A tiny bit too small on a high DPI display, but it's still readable. It's not like, you know, terminal text if you haven't configured your your output font. It's it's a. Uh, a lot easier to read. Um, so are there any questions about the boot process or uh, kernel stub or anything like that? How exactly does kernel stub put into running every time the kernel is updated? Is it some like, APT thing that would only work on Debian? Or it, it depends a little bit on your, uh, on your OS. Um, for in, in Debian-based systems, there's a, a folder uh, in Etsy's called uh, kernel, and it has hooks for when the kernel gets updated, every everything in the in the folder gets run. Um, uh, the Debian package installs a, a file there, uh, a script that runs kernel stub with the options it needs to uh, to do the the update. Um, there's a similar folder for the initramfs. We we hook into that. If you're using initramfs tools, um, I was using Draycut on Ubuntu for a little while. Draycut is the one that uh, Red Hat and Fedora use, and it doesn't actually need to be run. It doesn't need, need this to run every time. Uh, it just puts stuff in the right places already, so we don't have to worry about 
that too much. Um, it works pretty well there. So it's it's a little more compatible with uh, some of the other tools. If you have the <coughs> NFS tools suite, which is kind of big and stuff like that, it's the default in Ubuntu and Debian and stuff. It, it has a hook to do it automatically. Sure. So if I have a computer, like an old desktop, that supports UEFI and also uh -huh. supports not booting in UEFI, why do I care? They both result in a Linux getting booted. It seems fine to me either way. I don't know why I have to fuss with this UEFI stuff. So UEFI, uh, I've seen that it boots a little bit faster in UEFI, but it might be specific to the firmware on your system. Um, the other thing that UEFI does is it gives, uh, if you have UEFI enabled, you can boot all your Linux OSs directly from the, the firmware boot menu, which is a little bit more integrated. Um, it works a little bit better with the specific firmware because it's part of that firmware. And then you literally don't ever have to talk, deal with uh, any, of the, any of the bootloader stuff. It just loads it. We still have system deboot for editing like options and stuff like that, but it's literally silent. You, know, you don't ever, you don't ever talk, talk to it at all. Um, it also, <coughs> at least theoretically, um, gives the, the kernel more direct control over some of the hardware because it's not talking to a, 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 an input-output system on the firmware that uh, uh, sits above it. Um, UEFI can transfer way more direct control of the hardware. I think right now Linux doesn't take a lot of advantage of that, but it's, as UEFI becomes more common, uh, that's going to be more and more possible. So that's one of the bigger things. And I saw a couple here up in the front first. What was the firmware do? It was like 12 or 13 seconds until it passed control to the loader. Right. What is it doing for 13 seconds? Mostly post. Um, it has to check all of the hardware on the computer, check the RAM, count how much there is. I have a lot of RAM in the system, and it has to count all of that. So lower RAM actually means faster boot times, ironically, uh, at least for the firmware portion of that. Um, I think actually you get faster boots with less RAM all over the case because uh, it's less to have to initialize and stuff like that. Um, obviously that has other performance implications uh, once you get the system up and running um, and it doesn't work as a, as a sustainable solution um, as, a, a, you know, as a whole to, re to reduce boot times. But that's a lot of it. Um, another thing, we're using a fairly generic uh, firmware on our systems and it, it's, uh, we do a lot of tweaking to make it all work with the, uh, Linux and stuff like that really well, but it does have a lot of stuff that it has to go through. Um, that's definitely something that we want to reduce, though, and all of that is in the hands of the firmware vendor. So, uh, you know, as as you get firmware updates, they have the potential to make the firmware lighter weight and uh, reduce the, the load of it. And there's another one back here. Um, so I would like to ask you to take a peek into your magic glass ball. So, do you think that uh, Linux distributions will drop, drop one day? So if all the hardware is modern enough and has actually UFI, um, why should they, they install Grub anyway? Or is it even, I remember when I installed an Ubuntu or a Debian, mm -hmm. at the end I'm asked, hey, do you want to install Grub? What would, you, what, what would happen if I answer no? Uh, those are, that's a good couple of questions. Um, I'll start with the first bit about whether uh, distributions are going to drop Grub. Um, it's hard for me to speak for other distributions. I am a Pop! OS core developer, so I do have a lot of say over stuff like that. Maybe not entirely the most unbiased decision in the world, dropping Grub and going with the thing that I wrote. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I think that's, we all want to be in that kind of position, so I, I think that's kind of okay. Um, so Pop! OS has already dropped Grub, at least for uh, UEFI installs. We still do Grub for um, uh, legacy boot because as of right now the way legacy boot works there's a lot of hacks almost that, that it takes to put the the final operating system in ram uh, legacy boot is a is a process that was really more optimized when dos was the operating system and it was really tiny um, in bios mode you have a very limited amount of ram to work with and so you actually have to split the bootloader into a couple of different parts which is why you have like grub stage one stage 1.2 and stage two and stuff like that those are all just different parts that load subsequent larger parts uh, off of different places to, to get the OS installed. Um, I would love to see more distributions at least look at dropping Grub. Um, I think Grub is a great tool and it serves a lot of purpose, but I don't know that it makes the most sense for it to be the default bootloader in most OSs. Um, a lot of desktop OSs now are aimed at PCs where you don't necessarily need to boot you know, DOS you know, DOS is a, a fallback for, you know, like if you're, you're 
heart motherboard manufacturer doesn't support a more modern firmware update, like anything from something after the 90s. Uh, so, so you know, a lot of a lot of motherboard manufacturers use DOS as a as a uh, fallback for like firmware updates, but but you can do that with UEFI now much better. Uh, we switched to doing UEFI firmware updates uh, at System76 a while ago. It makes it much easier to, to do it because you only need one file system, you only need one removable drive. You can distribute the whole thing in a zip file and just unpack it. You don't have to do any crazy flashing or anything like that. So it takes care of all of that. Um, you can even control the UEFI from the software really easily, which is something that a, a lot of uh, a lot of legacy BIOSes have a hard time doing. You can't really control the 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 configuration of the operating system very well from uh, with a running operating system, you have to go into the, the BIOS and control it manually. Um, so UEFI support is a good thing. It, it brings a lot of new features to, to the firmware that, that allow the, the operating system to be in control of the hardware rather, the, rather than the other way around. Um, and in, in a UEFI system, for, for most cases, you don't need something as big and complicated as Grub. You know, it has a lot of extra features we don't need. Um, I know that getting rid of features we don't necessarily want or need is, is one of the reasons a lot of us use Linux over something like Windows. And I think that, that going this direction with the boot process helps solidify that philosophy. Um, and I, obviously there will always be places where uh, Grub is necessary or, or desirable. Um, but for most general boot processes, um, I think this provides a better solution, a better end user experience. Um, what was the second part of your question again? I'm so sorry, I forgot. Um, I'm asked at the end of the installation, um, right, so at right. least with Ubuntu, if I want to install a graph. Right. Um, right now, if you pick no, uh, when you reboot, your system won't be bootable. You'll have to do other things in order to boot up. <laughs> they, they give you the option of installing your system in a way that you can't use it, which I don't think makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Debian does the same thing. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 we, uh, Linux likes to give the user choice, and sometimes, <laughs> sometimes that includes giving the user the choice to do bad things, uh, like, you know, we all know about, uh, RMRF slash, uh, which they thankfully tuned back a little bit, it makes it a little more difficult now, but you can still mute your system pretty bad just with a pretty basic file system operation command, so, um, it, it, you wouldn't be bootable, but you could very easily in the live environment set up kernel stub and system deboot, um, Another nice benefit of this is that if you have a Grub installation that somehow gets uh, corrupted or removed from the drive somehow, it's kind of a pain in the butt to, to fix that because you have to like mount your, your root partition and your ESP, and then you have to do some mount binds to like the dev and proc file systems and stuff like that. Then you have to root in so that you're actually in the environment that you want to repair, and then you can run the Grub install so that it actually detects all the stuff as if the system were actually running. Uh, kernel stub and system debug don't require any of that. You do have to mount the, the ESP so that you can modify the file system on it, but you don't have to mount the root partition. You just tell the system where it's at, and it figures out all the rest. So you could do that. Um, I think that's mostly why they give you that option if you want to set up a different boot system, but um, yeah, not normally something you, you'd have to do um, and probably shouldn't do if, if you're, you're just getting it set up. It's much easier to remove it afterwards than it is to boot the system without. And I saw one up here. In the in the beginning, you were you were saying um, NF supports file systems and file systems and <coughs> file systems. Right. Does it support all the modern file systems? I'm thinking ZFS particularly. No. But um, mm -hmm. otherwise, it seems like you're giving up an awful lot of flexibility to save 12% boot time, which is something most people don't do all that often. So with UEFI booting, um, the the firmware, the only firmware or file system format specified by the spec is for is for FAT32. So your ESP is going to be a FAT32 partition, usually at the beginning of your drive. Um, and then after that, you load you, you store whatever boot code you need on on that system, and that can include file system drivers for literally any file system you want. Um, as in addition, it, you'll store the kernel and the, uh, the inner MFS there, which will have all of the file system drivers for your system, but none of the file system drivers for the system that you know you don't actually run. And if you need a new file system driver, you can add that to your inner MFS or to your kernel. So it, 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 you still have support for all of those file systems. You just only have you only build in the support for the file systems that you're actually running, rather than support for all of them. 
And additionally, the inner MFS, at least in Ubuntu, already has support for you know any file system that Ubuntu can boot. You're just not loading it twice. So Grub has that support built into Grub, and then you're loading the inner MFS, which also has that support compiled in. Um, instead, you 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 only deal with the fat partition that has the uh, the, the kernel installed, and then you, you load all those files and drivers once, not a million times. So the thing written to the EFS, the FAT32, is NITRD and the kernel? Correct. Okay. Yeah. It would be interesting to get a show of hands of how many people are booting legacy MDR, you know, UEFI, just kind of curious. So if you don't know, then you don't know. Yeah, if, if, you know, if you know if you're booting MDR, can we get a show of hands real quick here? Okay, and then uh, UEFI? Okay, yeah. Um, there's a question back here somewhere. I thought I may have missed. Uh, Can you brick a laptop? Can you brick a. Not a with stuff like this. Yeah. You can get it to a point where the OS won't boot. Um, but one of the benefits of, of UEFI is uh, the bootloader code is all stored on a file system partition, which means you can just back it up. Um, and, and there are specs in UEFI that define where to look for bootloader code if there isn't any find, found in the NVRAM. That's that slash boot folder. Um, so you can, you can back up your boot code on like an external drive. So worst case scenario, if you can't boot your system, you can, you can you know, mount a live disk, copy your, boot lo your bootloader code back onto the ESP, and then your system starts booting again, just kind of without any additional recovery. So you just mount it as a file system. Yeah, it's just a regular file. It's like I said, it's a FAT32 <coughs> file system. It doesn't require any special option. I mean, everything supports FAT32, so. Uh, I think the scary thing about potentially breaking your system had to do with a certain Linux vendor having enabled experimental drivers in the kernel, which allowed certain NV uh, RAM variables to be writable that shouldn't have been writable. Oh, okay. Nor should they have been allowed to be writable by the actual firmware vendor. So like the vendor made a mistake, the driver got enabled, and then someone RM-RF insists that like tried to delete things that were deleting NVRAM variables, and that left their system break. I believe that Linux distribution vendor has since fixed the kernel to not include the driver. That's good. I think I remember hearing about this too, actually. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's a that's a bigger thing is. Um, as long as the EFI implementation at the, the software side and the firmware side is, is good and, and follows the spec, you shouldn't have any problems with it breaking the system. Even then, it should be possible to, to reset those variables by like pulling the CMOS battery and you know just waiting for the, oh. the, the system to reset because yeah. those should have default values somewhere yeah. uh, in a non-volatile storage. Um, so eventually you can get the system back up and running. Um, just depends on the firmware implementation and stuff so like that. Don't be afraid to run commands. Yeah, exactly. Don't be afraid to experiment with your system. That's how we all learned, right? We we didn't we didn't learn by being afraid to run commands. We were like, ooh, I want to tweak this and make it better. Uh, how well would something like this support, uh, like uh, perk clone? If you're just going to drop an entirely new operating system into an unused part of a partition, mm -hmm. how would you get something like that into the UEFI partition? Would that all be manual? Um, it depends. So if, if you have an operating system and you want it to be in your ESP, it's going to depend on that operating system whether or not it, it does the stuff automatically. But because the EFI system partition is just a regular file system, if it doesn't do it automatically, you can copy the stuff into it manually or write a script to maintain it automatically. Um, that's, I mean, that's basically what I did with kernel stub was I wanted to boot using the stub loader so I didn't have to use scrub and could have a faster boot but there wasn't any way to maintain it, so I wrote a Python script that does it. And eventually the Python script grew to be a little more modular and support some options, so it was less specific to my machine, something that could be transferred to other machines and, and improve the boot process all over the place. <coughs> so if it supports UEFI, it should do it automatically, um, but even if it doesn't, uh, you can do it manually and, and write stuff to do it automatically. I got one here, and then Christian. Um, so my question is, if um, is there like an easy way to back up the NVRAM as well in case, say, you know, you screw up your boot partition and you screw up the NVRAM and you need to restore from some sort of backup, is the NVRAM exposed to the file system at all or the, is it a separate deal? The NVRAM is exposed via the EFI VARS kernel module and it's mounted in the sys file system. Mm -hmm. 
I believe the specific path is slash sys slash firmware slash EFI, and it lists the file system, uh, the NVRAM variables as read only, mm -hmm. so you could copy those out. Mm -hmm. I don't know about making them writable. I think you can remount that read write, but it is a little dicey. I would be I would be worried about trying to write those variables from the file system, with the exception of boot entries. That's a pretty normal one. The boot order and the boot that entries. Was the main are, thing I was concerned about, really. Yeah, yeah. Those are those are those are easy to write to the write to the the NVRAM from the file system. Um, but a better way to do that, instead of worrying about the NVRAM, would be to um, Set up the bootloader such that it's it, it you know your default bootloader is duplicated. You have it stored in wherever it normally lives, and you have it stored in slash EFI slash boot slash boot x64, which is the default path that EFI will load if it doesn't have an NVRAM for a device. Mm -hmm. That's how like live boot live disks work. They they put a bootloader there, and that loads the system. And you do that with as a as a backup whenever you do an EFI bootloader on a on an OS. Um, and, and kernel stub and, and uh, system deboot do install copies of, uh, of backup stuff there. So um, then you can just clear the NVRAM if those get corrupted, and, and the system will detect where you're supposed to be booting from and boot it up correctly, at which point you can run the command to do it manually or just let it do the uh, recovery boot until you get a kernel update. Okay. Thank you. So I, there was a discussion earlier of like what is the value of doing this, and I think one of the most important things is to Understand that secure boot is not a bad thing. What secure boot provides you is the ability to know that you're booting the system that you expect to be booting. So the idea <coughs> being that you have a certificate key in your uh, your storage, your TPM on the device, that I'm only booting a kernel that I expect to be booting. The and it difficulty hasn't been when you with, inject yeah. something like grub into this process is at each stage that you transfer. Uh, control of execution, you need to prove that the previous version, you need to prove that that is correct before you allow it to be executed. So if you're going from the boot system into Grub, that means Grub has to fully support the secure boot chain, and then it has to go and check a kernel that it can support and has a signed certificate. And you just have to keep verifying these. If you go directly to a stub loaded, or a kernel with a EFI stub, it only needs to check that. And then if that's guaranteed, to only load kernel modules that have also been signed. You can have a system that is executing what you expect and we protect ourselves against bootloader attacks that are running malicious code that are persistent across reboots. So the value here is if you do get exploited for some reason, simply rebooting your system gets you back to a secure state. Right, right. And that's an important process to be able to trust our computing devices. And, a, and an important part of secure boot, something that not every implementation does implement, even though they're supposed to, is the ability to add your own cryptographic keys to the firmware. If you add a cryptographic key to the firmware and and sign your the code you load at boot with it, you can be sure at a cryptographic level that, that the code you're running has not been tampered with. And that's the biggest way that secure boot works. Um, it's not designed to keep people from booting Linux or other operating systems, um, even though sometimes it, it can be used to effectively do that. Um, you know, it's not, it's not how it's designed to be implemented, and, and if stuff follows the spec correctly, you can, you can make sure that it doesn't. You can have whatever keys you want. Um, but yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent point. A big part of, of why you want to go with UEFI, and maybe even with Secure Boot, is, is it allows full cryptographic uh, security of the, the whole boot process. You know you're loading code that you have authorized to run, or at least that your OS distributor has authorized to run. Um, you know, if you don't trust your OS distributor, you probably shouldn't be running that OS. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, pick a pick a different one that you do trust. Um, but but it allows you to be be sure at a cryptographic level that that you're not running malicious code. And and I'm sure as a as a bunch of Linux people, we're all fairly fairly aware that that cryptographically secure code is very very difficult to break. Right. If it's signed and stuff like that, it's very difficult to, to, to fake that signature in a way that still also does what you want it to do. Um, change an MP5, or if you change a file, the, the checksum completely changes. It's completely different. It's very easy to make sure that that, that doesn't happen. And with the strong hashing algorithms, uh, we, can, we can be sure that, that hash collisions are, are extremely difficult to produce. So any other quick questions before we head out? Well, I was just sort of wondering, sure. you, did, you sort of talked more about UFI and 
with secure boot, are the stubs that you're using, are those signed with the Microsoft key? So the way, right now, the pop boot infrastructure doesn't currently support secure boot because we don't have a signed version of system D boot. It's very easy to rectify, but as of right now, it's, it's something that, that isn't there. We hope to have that support in there soon. Um, the way it would ideally work is you would use a program like Shim, which would allow uh, the, so Shim as a binary and your bootloader are both signed with the Microsoft key because those are components that don't change very frequently. And then once you have that, Shim is allowed to register separate keys that belong to the OS distributor so that you can distribute kernel updates without having to send the kernel out to Microsoft to get signed. So, so the, the kernels are signed with the, the OS distributor's key um, or you can add your own keys. So if you want to build your own kernels, you can sign them and, and add the keys into, uh, into Shim and keep that cryptographic verification uh, without, without having to worry about not being able to load your own code. So, but, but yeah, so the way, the way it works with Ubuntu, um, since Pop is based on Ubuntu, it's a good, a good analogy. Uh, you, have, you have the OS, um, or sorry, the firmware, which loads uh, Shim, which is a little program written by uh, Matthew Garrett that enables CUEFI support and Grub, basically. And then it, uh, it, it's signed by Microsoft. It loads Grub and checks that Grub is signed by Microsoft. Um, Grub then looks for the Linux kernel to load. It picks the one off the drive. It sends it over to Shin to verify that it's been signed with canonical signing key, which is separate from the Microsoft key. And then if that matches, it will all load Grub and or I'll, I'll load the, the kernel and, and fully boot the system. I think it also works with uh, kernel modules too, if I'm not mistaken. It, it checks the signatures on kernel modules, which are signed by uh, the kernel. The kernel has to check that. Oh, the kernel checks the kernel, that. So, like, you're always delegating trust to the next thing down. Gotcha. So it's like by booting the Linux kernel, the Linux kernel is compiled with module checking support. You're trusting the kernel to now enforce only loading modules that too have been signed right. by a certificate. Right. Okay. I didn't. I thought it might delegate to, to Shin the way that Grub goes backwards in the chain to verify the next step, but I, I wasn't sure. It might use sure. PCR values or something to, to do it. But yeah, yeah. Like the TPM. Right. All right. I think that's all we have time for. I think I have <laughs>